Hi everyone, timestamps are in the description. This is the second paper that you sat, which was called paper three. Feel free to skip any questions that you want. Uh, as I say, the timestamps are in the description. Uh, and also you can play me at 1.25 speed or 1.5 speed because sometimes I might ramble a little bit, go into too detailed of an explanation for you and um, you can either skip past that or or speed me up. It's it's up to you. Anyway, I'm going to do the questions in order and uh, start with, with question one. So, write 72 as a product of its prime factors. Um, we'll start by drawing a factor tree for 72. Now, 72 is 8 times 9. 8 is 4 times 2. 2 is prime, so I circle it. 4 is 2 times 2. I circle those. 9 is 3 times 3. And what's really important to remember is product means timesing stuff together. So it's not enough just to list the factors. The factor tree itself it will be worth one mark out of two, as long as the factor tree is correct. To actually get the full marks, I'm going to need to either write 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 3, or, best of all, I mean, this is two marks out of two, by the way. You don't have to write it with indices, but it is better if you write it with indices. Okay, so this is two cubed times three squared. Uh, and then for part B, we are being asked about the number 72, which we've already got a factor tree for, and the number 108. So let's do a factor tree for 108. So that's two 54s, that's two 27s, that's nine threes, and that's three threes and I circle all the primes. And the idea when I'm being asked about HCF and LC or LCM um, is, well, I can either list factors. So I could just list the factors of 72 and list all the factors of 108 um, and then see which one's the biggest that's in common. That's a perfectly valid strategy. Um, or use the Venn diagram method with the prime factors. So that's what I'm gonna do here. So I need a Venn diagram with the number 72 and the number 108. And then I pair up everything that's in common across these factor trees. So there's a two and a two goes in the middle, a two and a two goes in the middle, a three and a three goes in the middle, and a three and a three goes in the middle. There's nothing else that pairs up. So everything here is paired up. There's no extra three over there and there's no extra two over here. So I'll put a three here, which is this one for the 108, and I'll put a two here, which is this one for the number 72. And because I'm being asked about the HCF, the highest common factor, I'm gonna look at the things that are um, in common in, in the intersection, okay? So I'll do two times two times three times three. So the HCF is the product of the intersection um, for the record, just in case you were wondering if it asks for the LCM, we would multiply everything in the Venn diagram, but because it's the HCF, it's just whatever's in the intersection. Um, so I'll do 2 times 2 times 3 times 3, which is 6 times 6, which is 36. Okay, so uh, that's my answer for question 1. Uh, another little point I'd like to make just before moving on is it's very unlikely by the way that you would get a question like this but just in case you do if you are ever in a situation where there's actually no numbers in the intersection um, because there was nothing you could pair up there is always secretly a one in the intersection in fact you could put as many ones into here as you wanted and it wouldn't change any of the answers because timesing by one everything just stays the same so the HCF of two numbers that otherwise don't have any factors in common is actually one. So you must you must always remember that just in case it, it comes up. Okay. Anyway, question uh, two. The scatter graph shows information about the scores two judges gave 11 competitors. So we've got judge A and judge B and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven different competitors. Okay, um, and so there's another competitor. Judge A gives them a score of four point six. So this is the Judge A axis, and Judge B gives that competitor a score of three point eight. So this is the Judge B 
axis and our first question is to show that on the scatter graph so I need to go along to 4.6 on the uh, judge A axis, which is 4.123456, and I'll need to go up. Now, I don't actually have a ruler with me, so I'm going to have to use a protractor um, to get a straight line. So it's going to be somewhere on this straight line, and how I judge it is to go at 3.8 on the judge B axis and go along. And that's going to go here, okay? So that's that point there. Um, just there. I don't know if it's maybe a bit blurry because it's not on autofocus, but never mind. There you go. So that's that's that one. Now, what type of correlation does the scatter graph show? So since the points kind of ha go up, uh, uphill from from left to right, that's called positive correlation. So you just need to write the word positive there. <coughs> and uh, lastly, for the next competitor, Judge A gives a score of 3.7. Using the scatter graph, find an estimate for the score Judge B will give this competitor. Now, it's always going to be worthwhile drawing a line of best fit if you are you asked to estimate something from a scatter graph. Okay? So it's really important that you don't just uh, sort of guess it based on the scatter graph without a line of best fit because if you are wrong and you are outside of the range of values that the mark scheme allows you'll get zero marks whereas if you've got a fairly reasonable line of best fit drawn you you can get at least one mark for it being correct based off of your line of best fit so i would always encourage you to draw in a line of best fit now the way a line of best fit has to work is it does have to kind of follow the general trend in the data so i can't just you know make it go downhill for example when clearly it's meant to go uphill and then the other thing that you're supposed to do is try your best to make sure that there are about the same number of points above the line of best fit as there are below so because there's going to be um 11 competitors plus an extra one that's 12 competitors so we want to try to draw a line that is going to have six points above it and six points below it now that's not particularly easy here um it's not a it's not particularly obvious exactly where you should draw this line of best fit because if you think about it if you want these it would have to be these six here that were below it but then it kind of feels like they're a little bit too far that would make the line a little bit too far away from from the rest of the data so it is a little bit of sort of a little bit subjective um as long as it's not too crazy it's and it's gonna hopefully be all right so i'm gonna draw mine here um it is closer to these points but then that isn't that unreasonable um because you know we do want about the same number either side of the line and really the only way i can do that is by putting the line there and then what I'm going to do is find 3.7 for Judge A. So that's here. Go up to the line of best fit that I've just drawn. Uh, it's not the easiest when I'm trying to also record it, but I shall try. And then I go across to the Judge B uh, uh, axis, which is here. And this gives me, based on my line of best fit, an estimated th uh, score of three from Judge B. Now, if memory serves me correctly, um, I'll just quickly grab the mark scheme. I'm pretty sure you're allowed anything between 2.5 and 3.5. So let's have a look. I just can't quite remember. Yeah, so you're allowed anything from 2.5 to 3.5. So me actually getting 3 is actually exactly in the middle. But you would be allowed to do anything from 2.5 to 3.5 and you get the marks. You would be allowed to be partially out of that um, as a sort of a follow through mark from your line of best fit. As long as your line of best fit wasn't completely wrong. Okay, so um, anyway, yeah, that's question two. Now we're going to move on to question three. <coughs> so, uh, A, B, C, D 
uh, this shape here is a trapezium and we're being asked to work out this length here and um, this sort of question where, where, we, where we've got right angles and we've got this height here and this height here it's kind of crying out to, to basically use Pythagoras. It's a hidden Pythagoras question and they're really, really common. So you want to try to, uh, if you can't already kind of quickly recognize that this is a hidden Pythagoras question, that's maybe something that you might want to um, look into practicing. Um, so in any, in any case, the idea is we basically fill in this um, secret line that you know wasn't given to us, but we can draw in for ourselves. We get a little right angle here. This is six meters. The idea is it's the same as the six meters at the bottom there. And this unknown length here is gonna be 13.2 uh, take away 8.4. So it's gonna be 4.8 meters tall. And um, there were a few that I marked where, but basically it seemed as though the, the uh, you, um, knew you had to use Pythagoras but you didn't show any working and rounded incorrectly or there was something that went slightly wrong and you ended up with zero marks for this question and um, that's a shame because it's actually really easy to show that a tiny bit of working for Pythagoras that's going to get you the marks in case you make a mistake. So what you would want to do is just write down 6 squared plus 4.8 squared is equal to, and you can either write AB squared, or you can give this a little name, so you might call it X, or, or you could have called it C, C for the longest side in a right angled triangle. You can call it anything really, but I'm going to call it X, and that will equal X squared, and then I'll do the square root of, um, so if I do 6 squared plus 4.8 squared, do the square root of 59.04, that's going to give me my x number. So if I square root that, I will get 7.7. .7. But here's a really good tip. You should write out your calculator display at least to a few decimal digits, okay? So 7.68 dot dot dot, just to make sure that the examiner knows that that's what you got on your calculator. Um, just in case you then make an error going forward, maybe an error in the rounding, because sometimes, dependent on the mark scheme, you might be allowed to get all the marks because of your actual, um, you, you've shown you, you, what you got on the calculator. Now, that wouldn't apply in this specific question, it's just a bit of general good advice, okay? So anyway, this rounds to 7.7, because .7, the 8 rounds the 6 up to a 7. Right, question four. Make H the subject of the formula K equals three lots of 2H take away one. Now there are a few um, steps that you could do um, and, and a few different answers that are basically all equivalent. So I'm just gonna show you, um, well, I'm gonna show you, I think two or three different answers um, and, I'll, and I'll sort of talk about, there's one where really you shouldn't go with that as your final answer, but I'll talk about it when I get to it. So I will go option one. Um, now obviously in the real exam, you would just do one of these options. You wouldn't show all three of them. Um, you could ex start by expanding the brackets. That's, that'd be a very reasonable first step. So K equals three lots of two H take away one. I'll expand the bracket. So K equals six H take away three. So that would be your first step. That would be a mark for a correct first step. Now, an alternative first thing to do would be to actually divide both sides by three. We're trying to get at what H is and um, dividing both sides by three kind of gets rid of the brackets in, in, in a different way. So I'm gonna have K equals three, lots of two H take away one. And if I divide both sides by three, I'll get K over three is equal to two H take away one. Okay, now let me just talk about these um, sort of separately. Um, so the, for this one, I would add three to both sides. So K plus three is six H. A few people um, still wrote K take away three, even though we've added three to both sides. Uh, and then lastly, I will divide by six. So K plus three over six is H. 
So that's going to be my final answer. H is k plus 3 over 6. Now, if I keep going with this, uh, I would add 1 to both sides. So k over 3, add 1 is equal to 2h. And I'm just going to write this up here as kind of my, my option 3 because... Well, let me just write it. Um, what you can now do, of course, to, to get what h is, if you followed this, um, these steps, is if you divide both sides by 2, you've got k over 3 plus 1, and now you're dividing both sides by 2, and that equals h. Now, the question does not ask you to fully simplify your answer. So this, technically speaking, is a is a final answer. We've got h by itself and it's in terms of k. Um, so let me just uh, write that up again here. But this is not a good final answer because there's a fraction inside a fraction and there was no kind of need for that to happen because what we could have done instead is instead of um, writing the whole thing divided by 2 so let me just sort of get rid of that, is if you divide both terms separately by 2, if you've got k over 3 and you halve that, you'll get k over 6. And if you've got 1 and you halve that, you'll get a half. And so this would have been another option, okay? And if you go for a common denominator of 6, you would have k plus 3, all over 6, which is, of course, this answer here. So all of these, that one, that one, that one, and that one, are all equivalent answers. This one isn't a great final answer in, in really because it's got a fraction inside a fraction, but that didn't matter so much for this question because it didn't want fully simplified, okay? A fully simplified fraction won't have a fraction in the numerator or a fraction in the denominator, it would have been dealt with and making sure that there weren't any fractions in either the numerator or the denominator. Okay, so anyway, that's that one. Let's move on. <coughs> okay, question five. So the diagram shows a shape made from a rectangle and a semicircle. We're told the perimeter of the rectangle is 64. The When we've got this ratio here that AB to BC is 3 to 1. Now it was kind of a, a, an unfortunate common mistake that people shared 64 in the ratio 3 to 1. But if we think really clearly, um, these two sides actually have to add up not to 64 but to 32 because it would be 32 add 32 make 64. So we actually have to start by sharing um, 32 centimeters in the ratio uh, 3 to 1 okay so 32 divided by 4 is 8 and then 8 times 3 is 24 so this length is 24 and that length is 8 okay so we've actually got 24 and 8 24 and 8 all adding up to 64 and um, these sides are in the correct ratio of 3 to 1. So now it asks us to work out the area of the shape. Now it's a compound shape, which means it's a rectangle plus a semicircle. So we've got to work them out separately and add them up. So the rectangle is the easy part. You do 24 times 8. And then we're going to add that to the semicircle. Now the way we get the area of a semicircle is to work out the area of a full circle and halve it. Now if this was a full circle, it would have um, diameter 8, which means the radius would be 4. So I'm just going to write that down, that the radius would be 4. And that's relevant because the area of a circle is pi r squared. Okay, So the area of a circle is pi times r squared. So what we need to do here is do pi times 4 squared, but then halve that because it's a semicircle, not a full circle. So basically I'm just going to add these two things up, um, just so that I've shown um, like 
how do I describe this? So I could just type this whole thing straight into the calculator, but just because it would be fairly straightforward for me to show this um, answer in my working separately, that might often be worth doing. So 24 times eight, because uh, there might be a mark that's just separate for the correct area of the rectangle. And so if I've written 192, um, that might help guarantee me a mark. If I type this whole thing into the calculator wrong, get a wrong answer here, I might still rescue a mark if I've written 192. Okay, so just worth bearing in mind. And then pi times four squared. I mean, I don't really need a calculator for this. That's 16 pi. Halved is going to be eight pi, so plus eight pi. But actually what I need is my final answer here to be to three significant figures. So 192 plus that is 217. Um, 0.13 blah 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 but it was to three significant figures and uh, as I said before it is worth writing down a few digits off your calculator um, it's just a good habit to be in because maybe sometimes you'll forget to do it but if you if you're kind of thinking along the lines of um, I should try to do it I should try to remember to do it then it's just a good habit to be in because of the marks you might gain by your working out and um, making sure that the examiner can see what you've actually got on your calculator because sometimes that can rescue you a mark if you've made a mistake somewhere else. But anyway, to three significant figures, that's 217. So anyway, the ratio is now reversed. The length of AB to the length of BC is now not three to one anymore, but it's swapped and it's one to three, which means that the AB length would be eight and the BC length would be 24. So just as a little sketch, that turns it into a picture that looks like this. So that would now be eight, and that would now be 24. And so the question is, how does that affect the area of the shape? Well, the rectangle part, it doesn't affect the answer, because if you swap the, le the length and width round, it's still gonna give you an area of 192 centimeters squared. But it has made the semicircle bigger, so it's going to increase as the semicircle radius uh, is increased. So you can just write something along those lines, okay? Doesn't have to be exactly that, but something like that. So that's that, and then we can look at question six. Now, of course, there are three main ways of solving a, a quadratic equation. They are by factorizing, they are by completing the square, and by the quadratic formula. Now in this one, um, or rather, let, let me start that again, um, you always want to check if it can factorize because doing either of the other two things is a little bit overkill. Um, and a one like this that appears this early on in the paper will typically factorize. So we're just going to try and factorize it to start with. So x and x to get the x squared, and then I want two numbers that add up to make two and times to make uh, minus eight. Now those numbers are four and minus two. So it doesn't take too long to, uh, to work those out. Uh, so four take away two is two, so that works. And four times minus two is minus eight, so that works. Now this means that x is either equal to negative four or x is equal to two. So negative four or two, okay? So or x equals. And then that's that question done. Just very quickly, I'll show you how you could complete the square to get the same answer. Because um, this is a, not a too bad of a one to complete the square on because it's already one x squared and the number of x's is even. So it's actually pretty much just as fast to complete the square in this situation. So I'd open a bracket, write x, half the number of x's is one close the bracket right squared, don't forget about the minus eight, and then take away this number squared, okay? So one squared is one, so take that away, and um, it still equals zero, so I'm still gonna write equals zero. So x plus one all squared, take away nine is zero. x plus one all squared is equal to nine, which means that x plus one is either positive three or negative three. And then I'll just take away one from both sides to get my answers. So x is negative one plus or minus three, 
And as you can see, if I do minus one, add three, I get two. And if I do minus one, take away three, I get negative four. Now, of course, 99% of people will just do it this way. But it's always, you know, I'm, I'm going through the question, makes sense to, to just remind you about completing the square, okay? Right, number seven. Um, I would just go ahead and, and write out 3a and 2b separately and then subtract them once I've got them, okay? So 3a would be three lots of this vector 3, 4, which would be 9, 12. And 2b would be two lots of the vector 1, 5, which is 2, 10. And when I subtract them, so let me write this out, 9, 12, take away 2, 10. 9 take away 2 is 7, and 12 take away 10 is 2. Uh, and that I think that one's uh, quite nice, really. There were, wasn't anything too bad. We weren't taking away a negative or anything like that, which can trip people up. That this was, this was okay. Right, question eight, which I also think is generally all right. Um, this one's the quadratic one. So it's the one that has to be y equals x squared. So we might as well get that one over with. So that's that one. y equals two is a horizontal line that goes through y is two. So that's c. And then the ones that caused the most confusion were A and D. Now, Y equals X has a positive gradient because it's Y equals 1X. It's positive 1. It's going 1 along, 1 up, 1 along, 1 up. So that's this one. So that's D. And that leaves A for Y equals negative X, which has a negative gradient which means it's going downhill. So that for me would be the most obvious way of telling. Uh, there are plenty of other ways you can tell. I mean, if it's y equals x, then one, one has to be on there. Two, two has to be on there. Three, three has to be on there. The x and the y's have to be the same. And that's only true if you're on this line here. It's not true if you're on that line there. Um, on this line, um, what the y's and the x's, one is the negative of the other, which is exactly what um, that graph is, right? y equals negative x. So anyway, that's that. Uh, question nine. Uh, a lot of people forgot how to draw a frequency polygon. Um, frequency polygons are kind of weird. Um, and if you forget how to draw them, you haven't revised them, you haven't done them in ages, then yeah, this is a, basically an impossible question. Um, the way you draw it, specifically for a frequency polygon, so this is not a histogram, it's not a bar chart, it's not cumulative frequency, it's something really specific called a frequency polygon. And the way you draw one is you go to halfway on all of these, so I've got 2.5, I've got 7.5, 12.5, 17.5, 22.5, and 27.5. I go to halfway, so that's really important. You go halfway, and then you just simply plot 2.52. Now, the scale isn't very easy on this, so I'm going to put it in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I don't need to go higher than 15. And then there's where 2.5 is. 5, uh, 7.5, 10, 12.5, 11, 12, 15. So I just fill these in just so I don't make a mistake, basically. And then I uh, go from there. So 2.52 is there. 7.55 is here. 12.515 is there. 17.512 is, there's 10, 11, 12. There's 22.5, and I need to go to 11, which is there. And 27.56 is there. So you plot those. So that's at the midpoint, and then the frequency number. And then you join these up with straight lines. <clears throat> like this. And 
And then that's it. You do not join the last ones up. You'd lose a mark if you did that. Um, that's a frequency polygon. That's how you draw them. Okay. So that's two marks. Okay. And then part B, find the class interval that contains the median. Now the median, when you've got 51 people, um, you've got to sort of either have some good method already in your head. So one way you can do it is just by doing 51 add one and then dividing by two, it'll be the 26th person. So that's one way you can do it. Um, I like to think of it as, you know, there'd be 25 people, then there'd be one person in the middle and then there'd be another 25 people. And then that would be 51 people altogether. So this would be the 26th person. So in any case, in, in any way you work it out, it's going to be the 26th person if you've got 51 people and you want the median. Okay, that's where the halfway person will be. So we need to find where the 26th person is. Well, they're not in the first sort of um, interval because there's only two people in that interval. So you do need to kind of work out the cumulative frequency just so that you can sort of see where the 26th person will be. So the first two people, the first seven people, the first 22 people, and then if we're in this category here, or this interval or class or group, whatever you want to call it, if you're in this one here, you will be past the 22nd person. So you'll be the 23rd up to the uh, 34th person. Now, if you are obviously one of those people, you'll be the one of those people is the 26th person, right? So that means the 26th person is in this group here, which means I have to write down 15 less than M less than or equal to 20. Okay, and I need to copy it down exactly as it was in the table. And that's it. Okay, and then there is another question that's to do with this. So let's just have a, a little look at um, what the question says. So Terry says, at least one of the people spent 30 pounds. Uh, is Terry correct? So let's have a look at this table. Now, there are six people who spent between 25 and 30 pounds. And if I'm being more precise, over 25, so that could be 25 pounds and a penny, by the way. A few people thought it meant 26, but it's like, no, it doesn't, it didn't say it had to be a whole number of pounds. Okay, so it's this, these people spent from 25 and a 25 pound and a penny up to 30, but it it doesn't give any information on exactly what they spent. Like maybe, maybe they all spent 30 for all we know, or maybe they all spent 25 pounds and a penny. Maybe two of them spent 26, two of them spent 29, and the last person spent 29 pound 23. Who can say? The point is, is we do not know for sure that someone actually did spend £30. So is Terry correct to say this? No. And the reason is six people spent between £25 and £30, but we do not know exactly what they spent. And, you know, you could say there's lots of different ways, really, that you could have said that. I'm not saying you need this exact phrase, but we but the point is we don't know exactly what the distribution was in that interval. OK, we we don't know. Maybe someone did spend 30. I, I don't know. Um, it's possible, but we don't know for sure. OK, so that's why I'm writing. But we do not know exactly what they spent. OK, if the if Terry had said at least one of these people could have spent 30, then Terry's correct versus, for example, if Terry says at least one of these people spent 40. And in which case the answer is clearly no, because they were they maxed out at 30. OK, but based on how it's written, based on exactly what Terry said, the answer is no. Right, question 10. 
Uh, a number is rounded to two decimal places, the result is 7.28. So um, we can, um, loads of us can now do this really quickly, but let me just show you the, the sort of method that will take a little bit longer, but uh, I'm gonna do it because I'm obviously going through it. So you write down 7.28, the next possible answer to two decimal places is 7.29, and the previous possible answer is 7.27. And then the bounds, which is where the error interval comes from, are halfway. Okay, so this is where your lower bound is. This is where your upper bound is. And um, again, just pretending we don't know how to find out what these numbers are. Let's go halfway between 7.27 and 7.28. We've got a calculator. I add them up and divide by 2. That lets me go halfway. And of course, I get 7.275. My upper bound will be 7.2825. And I just need to remember how I actually write down the error interval. So 7.275 is less than or equal to n, which has to be less than 7.2825. The idea, oh, have I made a, yo, know, sorry, yes, that should just be a five there, shouldn't it? I've done well to get to question 10 uh, without having to uh, scribble anything out. There we go. So the idea is, is of course we could equal the lower bound because of the way numbers round, we round up. Uh, so here this, if it actually equaled this, it would round up to 7.28. Um, whereas we could be anything up to, but not including 7.285, okay? So that's why I use that symbol there because I can't actually equal 7.2. 285 because if I did, that would round up to 7.29. So that's why the error interval takes this uh, structure here, all right? Anyway, question 11. <coughs> so Dan invests £14,000 in a savings account. The savings account pays compound interest at a rate of 4% for the first year, and then X% percent for each extra year. And there's a total amount of this number here after three years. So we had that in the first year, and then there were two more years. So that's three years. So let's work it out after the first year. Now a 4% increase has a multiplier, um, 1.04. Now, again, where does that 1.04 come from? I'll just really quickly remind you. The idea is, is um, I will be left with 104%. I started with 100%. So to work out what I've times by, I'll do 104 divided by 100. That gives me my multiplier of 1.04, okay? So I'm gonna do 14,000 pounds times 1.04. So 14,000 pounds times 1.04 is 14,560 after year one and then we times by um some different multiplier now what out the, the way i've been teaching this is um just give the multiplier some different name you don't want you don't call it x because the multiplier for four percent wasn't four was it so the multiplier for x percent increase isn't x so give it some other name i might just you call it m for multiplier so 14,000 times M, and it's not just going to be M, because it was for two years, it, I times by M, and then I times by M again, so that would be M squared, is got to equal, oh sorry, and again, ooh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm on a bit of a bad roll with my mistakes here, not 14,000, sorry, the 14,560 number, isn't it? So 14,560 times m squared is meant to be the number we've got here, 15,297 pounds 10, where m is the multiplier for an x percent increase. Okay, so if m turns out to be 1.07 or something, then I would know that x had to be 7, right? So I work out M, the multiplier first, and then work out what that corresponds to in terms of an increase, 
Okay, so to solve this, I'm going to do uh, I'm going to divide by fourteen thousand five hundred and sixty both sides. So fifteen thousand two hundred ninety-seven pounds and ten pence divided by fourteen thousand five hundred and sixty. So this is clearly a job for my calculator. So fifteen thousand two hundred ninety-seven pounds and ten pence divided by it was actually my previous answer so I'm just going to press answer and that is 1.050625 and if I want what m is it would be the square root of that and there's really no reason to round this I wouldn't round this to 1.05 here um, purely because I shouldn't round too early on in a question. I should be as accurate as possible and round at the end if I need to. There's nothing to stop me just going square root and then answer, right? I don't need to actually, I didn't need to round it. There was no, there, there was no advantage to me. It just would mean I would lose accuracy if I did round it. So the square root of my 1.05 blah, blah, blah number gives me well, it gives me 1.025, so 1.025. Now, if that's my multiplier, what does that correspond to? And if we can't quickly and easily see that that's 2.5%, one way we can do it is multiply this multiplier by 100. So if I apply that to 100%, I now have... 102.5%. How much has it gone up by? 2.5%. Okay, so 2.5. Um, I don't need to write the percentage symbol because x is just the number itself. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily lose a mark if I, if I write percent, but I don't have to because x is actually just the number. Okay, so x is 2.5 and that's question 11. Right, question 12. Show that x squared, x minus 1, x plus 3, so triple brackets, um, can be written in that form, blah, blah, blah. So it's just basically asking you to expand these brackets. So the way you'd want to do this, and I, I always, whenever I revise this with the class, um, talk about, you know, how would you do it if it was just numbers? Like, what if it was just 2 times 3 times 5 or something like this? And of course, in order to do 2 times 3 times 5, which is 30, we would do, first of all maybe do 2 times 3 so and get that answer, which would be 6, times 5. So 2 times 3 is 6, and then times 5, 30. That gives me my final answer. Now you might notice I could do um, 2 times 5, which is 10, and then times 3, which is 30. Or I could do 3 times 5, which is 15, and then times that by 2, which would be 30. The point is, I pick any two, multiply them together, get an answer, and then times that by the last one. That's exactly how this works, okay? So I'm going to start by multiplying x plus 2 and x take away 1. Um, I'm going to do that with the grid method, because I think that's by far the best overall method for you to be using x times x is x squared, x times 2 is 2x, negative 1 times x is negative x, and negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. And then the advantage of doing it with a grid method is you can take this answer, put it straight into the next grid. So this will be x squared x, because 2x take away 1x is just 1x, which is x, and then take away 2, and I'm that's my answer for these first two getting times together. And so I need, now need to times that answer by x plus 3. So this gives me x cubed and x squared minus 2x, 3x squared, 3x, and minus 6. And when I group together my like terms, I get x cubed plus 4x squared, 3x take away 2x is 1x, which I should just write as x in my final answer. You do risk losing a mark because 1x is not fully simplified. That's like I ask you, um, 
what's one times five and you just answer me back with one times five it's like yes it's true but you could just say five right here what's one times x well it's just x right so that's why you would you wouldn't write it as one x and then lastly take away six and that does actually answer the question if you wanted to take it a step further you could now write down a is one b is four a c is one and d is negative six you could write that down if you wanted to but you don't need to to have answered the question right question 13 now um i when i see a question like this i always think of a very sort of set method um that i think when you get your head around um, these questions are really not too bad, okay? So what's the idea? Well, first of all, let me just draw this straight line and put the points on in some random place. So A, B, C, D, right? Not to scale. And the idea is, is that the ratio A, B to B, D is 1 to 2. But the ratio A, C to C, D is 7 to 2. And that at first glance looks kind of weird because it's supposed to add up to three one and two but also add up to nine but remember a ratio if they're, if they're in a ratio it could be one to two but it could also be two to four or it could be three to six or it could be four to eight. It could be any other ratio that's equivalent to one to two. Similarly, the seven to two, it could be 14 to four. It, it doesn't matter. It's just giving it as a ratio, not actually telling you what they must add up to. So the way we want to actually work out what A, B, B, C, and C, D could be and write them out as a ratio is by making these add up to something that's, that's consistent. We want the AB to BD to add up to the same as the AC to CD. And normally what you would do, if these num if these were uh, a little bit more horrible in terms of the numbers, because this, this, these add up to three, these add up to nine, I'm just gonna make the first one three times as big, and they'll both add up to nine. But what you would do in general, say these added up to five and these added up to six, you times the first one by six and the second one by five, and you'd make them, add up to 30, right? You just, you're going for what's called the lowest common multiple, okay? That's what you want. And if you get the lowest common multiple, you'll end up with the uh, ratio here in, in the most simplified form. So basically the LCM of three and nine is nine, right? So that's why we want them both to add up to nine. So my AB to BD, which is one to two, what I actually want is to times this by three to get three to six, which now of course adds up to nine. And the AC to CD already equals something that adds up to nine, right? That's already done for you because these numbers weren't that hard, weren't that hard, okay? So AB has to be three and CD Maybe I'll underline them differently so that they stand out. CD has to be 2. So this is kind of how this works. You've got the AB number has to be 3 and the CD number has to be 2. And the question is, well, how do you work out what the BC number is? Well, this, this all had to add up to 9. Okay, so if that's 3 and that's 2, that's so far 5. That means this has to be 4. Okay, so um, nine take away three take away two equals four. And this means my answer is three to four to two. Okay, and genuine, that's how any question like this is gonna work. Okay, you make these add up to something consistent. Then you have your first number and you have your last number, right? You got your three and you've got your two. They, they, they literally correspond. And then the middle one is the thing you do at the end by making sure it all adds up. So here they all had to add up to nine, meant the middle number had to be four. Okay, so three to four to two. Right, question 14. <coughs> now, in question 14, 
This is one of these where you have to uh, get a, a region. And um, basically, how I've noticed most mark schemes seem to operate is you get a mark basically if you get the lines correct and then just one extra mark, maybe two at a push for the correct region. So the main thing to focus on is your ability to just plot these graphs correctly, plot these line graphs correctly, okay? Which is a more general skill really than finding the correct region. So let's do these one at a time. So what I would always do, if it's got an X and a Y in it and it's linear, which which it is, because there's no, um, it's not quadratic, it's not got any indices greater than one, so it's linear. Um, I would want to make y be the subject and I'd want to pretend this said equals and that's going to tell me what graph to draw, okay? So what I would do for this one is take away x from both sides and I would plot the graph minus x plus 3, okay? So y equals minus x plus 3. This one, I would plot the graph x equals 1. That's a special type of graph. That's going to be a vertical graph um, that goes through x is 1. This one here is just y equals um, a number. Now that's a horizontal graph that just goes through minus two on the y axis. And then lastly, this one is already kind of in the right format. We're just gonna plot the graph y equals two x take away one, okay? Now I know when I've taught this before, I've, 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 I've made the point that for these inequalities, if they're not, um, if they're just less thans or just greater thans, um, you should use a dashed line and if they're less than or equal to's or greater than or equal to's you should use a solid line now that is technically true but I've never I've never actually seen that be, be relevant in a mark scheme okay so we can just draw these line graphs without worrying about putting dashed lines okay so I'm going to first of all do y equals minus x add 3 that has a y intercept of 3 and it has a gradient of minus one, which means it goes one along, one down, one along, one down, one along, one down, and um, it's basically um, this graph here, okay? So let me just fill that in. Now I suspect if I actually had a ruler and not a protractor, and a, maybe if I was using a pencil, that might be a bit neater, but it's not too bad and would certainly get the marks. X equals one is this one here. So it's a vertical line that goes through one on the x-axis. And um, and this is something to be mindful of in the exam. If you notice, it's not the, it's not, it doesn't stand out that much what I've just drawn there. So I should probably go back over it just to make it stand out a little bit more. That, that will happen if you're having to draw over a uh, line that's already there okay so it's just worth bearing in mind you actually want to make sure that it can be seen um let me just label these as well i should just label them <clears throat> right y equals negative two goes uh through negative two on the y-axis uh, so that's y equals negative two and What's the last one? Y equals 2x take away 1. So that goes to negative 1. That's got a um, y-intercept of negative 1. And it's got a gradient of 2. Which means it goes 1 along and 2 up. Now, of course, I should point out that if the scale was a little bit dodgy, which sometimes the questions can be, um, say it went... Uh, you know, zero and then one, two, three instead of two, four, six. I would have to make sure I was plotting coordinates correctly, okay? Um, I can't just rely on counting squares unless I've checked in advance, which I, I did do, but I forgot to mention, so I'm mentioning it now, um, that the scales were consistent. So it's like, yes, that's clearly one along, one and one up, and they both correspond to the number one. So that means I can just very quickly plot the graph. Otherwise, you can do a table of values. So just a quick table of values, um, x, y, um, one, two, three, say. Now two times one is two, take away one is one. 
2 times 2 is 4, take away 1 is 3. 2 times 3 is 6, take away 1 is 5. I could now pl I could plot those coordinates, right? So there's 1, 1, there's 2, 3, and there's 3, 5. And if I kept going, I would plot more coordinates, right? So that's always an option available to you as well. If you forget about y-intercepts and gradients, okay? Just remember you can make a table of values. Um, it's a completely reasonable thing to do. You don't need to worry about it if that's what you need to do. Um, I mean, you should try to learn gradient intercept, but please don't get no marks, okay? You, you can just do this, all right? So anyway, we've got our lines. So this is y equals 2x take away 1. We've got our lines. And now what we need to do is we need to go back and have a look at these um, inequalities to see which one of these, what looks to me to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I think there's there's like a 1 in 11 chance of being right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Yeah, I think 11. And, you know, maybe if you're going to guess, you might guess it's this tiny little one, maybe. Or you might guess it's this one. You might guess it's this one. But basically, you've got a 1 in 11 chance if you're going to guess. Now, if you have no idea what to do, it is worth just guessing, putting the letter R somewhere and fingers crossed, okay? But how do we actually figure out what R is? Well, um, there's a few different ways, okay? Uh, well, well, there's two main ways. One is, is you're going to pick a coordinate and test it. And if it works for all of them, then that coordinate is in the correct region and you would know what region you had. Another is to kind of go one at a time and just sort of sort of eliminate part of the part of the um, diagram as you go as you go along until you're just left with one final region. OK, so um, if I look at this first one, X plus Y is less than three. So that was to do with this line here, remember? And I want to know on what side of this line would x plus y be less than 3? Well, it seems fairly reasonable to suggest it would be at, at the very least on the side where the origin is because 0 plus 0 is less than 3. So I already know my region is on that side of that line. Okay, so... Um, and, and this is where it gets a little bit awkward in the exam because it's like you really want to like shade out the bit that it isn't. Um, but if you make a mistake and you're using pen or even if you're using pencil, it's going to be a right pain if you're having to start rub things out. So it is a, it is tricky. OK, it is tricky. But I can be quite confident that because zero plus zero, where, which is the origin, is less than three, it's this side of this line. And so if I just sort of get rid of this part then I've at least eliminated one two three of my 11 regions so it's like I've already increased my, my odds if I just guess right now anyway x is has to be greater than one now will that include the origin or not and of course it won't because when, when you're at the origin x is zero right zero zero so y is also zero but x is 0, specifically, and 0 is not greater than 1. So that's this line here, right? And the side that has the origin isn't in the region. So that's this entire half here. And now I've got a 1 in 1, 2, 3 chance, if I just guess, okay? Now let's look at y is greater than minus 2. Well, that's to do with this line here, that line there. Now, which side is greater than minus 2? Well, it's this side, which means this bit isn't in the region. And here's the problem, you see, if I'm shading this out, if I do the shading kind of too dramatically and lose all the detail in the lines that I've drawn, might lose the marks, maybe. 
The only way I'm not going to do that is if my region is absolutely spot on. So it's, it is a trick. It's a definitely tricky type of question to do. Okay. And what a lot of people would try to do would be to not have to draw, um, would, would be to not have to do this shading, but I'm just showing you it as an option. You could do, uh, you could do this very lightly with pencil. Um, I've just got a pen here. If you're doing it very lightly with pencil, it can at least help you get the answer. Okay. And it's not going to interfere with your lines. So it's just something to bear in mind anyway. So anyway, I've now got a choice between two regions that will be decided by this last inequality here. Now that relates to this line here. And the question is, on which side is the Y numbers less than 2X minus 1? So on that line, the Y numbers are equal to 2X minus 1. Am I this side or am I this side? Am I in this tiny little region or am I in this region here? And if you can't easily decide, again, just pick a coordinate. Let's pick um, 2, 0, because that looks like a fairly easy coordinate to, to try. So I'm going to try 2, 0. Now, if x is 2, I'd have 2 times 2, which is 4. 4 take away 1 is 3. And is the y number of 0 less than 3? Yes, which means it works which means we're not in that tiny little region either. And it turns out that it's this region here, okay? Now, obviously you won't have access to a colored pen in the exam, but as I'm going through it, and I'm trying to make it of like highlighted nicely in, in the video, uh, I've done it like that, okay? So basically right at the end of the day, that's the region, okay? <clears throat> so yeah, the steps are draw the lines as though they say equals, make Y the subject where you can so that you can more easily draw the lines. That might involve a table of values. Make sure you know your special cases. If it's X equals a number, then it's a vertical line. If it's Y equals a number, then it's a horizontal line. And then after that, the one marker, like let's be clear, it's usually just worth a mark is identifying which region is is which uh, which region is the correct region now that can be something you get quite good at um, and wouldn't take that long um, but it's one of those things as well where it's like there are easier marks to get elsewhere in the paper so you've also got to kind of prioritize things but anyway that's how you do question 14. Right, question 15. So that was a really long question, that last one. This one's really, really quick, okay? It's actually crazy. I'm just going to bring this back a sec. This whole thing is worth four marks. This is worth three marks. And it's like two lines of working, all right? So this is called, this topic here is called capture, recapture. It's uh, um, where basically you don't know how many there are in the general population. So a researcher goes and captures a certain amount, tags them, releases them back into the wild, lets them mix, and then they go and they, get, they recapture some from the population and they see what proportion were tagged. Because when they go back and they recapture, some will have tags on from the other day, but others will, will be ones that weren't tagged originally. Um, and you can work. You can use that to estimate the uh, the the grand total of the population. Um, so in any case, how does that work? So we want an estimate for the total number of fish. Okay. So I'm going to call this x. And the idea is is on the is on the first day on Monday, we tagged 200 out of x. Right. 200 out of the total number of fish. Now this proportion is supposed to be equal to, um, and if this was a more complicated question to do with capture, recapture, that maybe be a part B about what assumptions have been made. I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but basically the idea is, is 200 out of the total is meant to equal 15 out of 90, okay? Because on Tuesday, we'll catch 15 and, uh, we catch 90 and 15 of them were tagged. So 15 tagged 
out of 90 is this meant to be the same as 200 tagged out of the population right this proportion on the tuesday is meant to be representative of the of the proportion of the population which is 200 out of x so anyway i'll just simply rearrange this so 200 times 90 would be 15x so <coughs> so x would equal 200 times 90 getting divided by 15 which is 1200 off the top of my head because i've marked the question but just for the record i'll obviously show you that on a calculator so 200 times 90 getting divided by 15 is 1200 now if there was a part b that asks what assumptions need to be made for this to be a valid estimate um there's two main ones and that is um when the fish or whatever it is in a different question when the fish are released back um they go and they mix randomly so if, if this just wouldn't work if these 200 fish that were tagged all went to one side of the lake like just literally all went and lived in one tiny little part of the lake right if that was true then when i catch 90 fish i'm probably going to get none or I'm going to get 90, depending on which part of the lake it was that I went and fished from. So the only way this is valid is if they've mixed at random. Also, the population can't change um, overnight or whatever over the time interval that it is. Okay, so the, the, the fish can't die. Okay, so there can't be, these tags can't injure the fish and kill them overnight, changing the population. Also, it assumes that the there's no uh, births uh, of new fish either that the population stays the same so those are the two um assumptions uh, to do with capture recapture okay um population stays the same and the mix at random right question 16 now question 16 i'm actually going to do it in two different ways okay um they're very similar obviously but because of the kind of variety in, in in how you could answer this question. I'm just trying to find it. Uh, I printed 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 it out. Is it under here? No. Oh, oh! It fell on the floor. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So I've I've actually printed out. Question 16 twice to do it in two different ways, okay? Um, so way number one is to work out the dimensions of model B and then do the calculations for model B. So model B, okay? Now, if I do it for model B, but I've only got these numbers for model A, I, I need to work out what the numbers would be for model B. And the way I'm going to do that is by using this ratio here. And the fact that and this 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 only works by the way because these the shape the model A and model B are similar. If they weren't similar then none of the maths that we're about to do here is valid. So it's why they have it has to say this in the question. Okay? Now because this is a length ratio, the height of model A that's height that's a length this is a length ratio so what it means is is that all the lengths you see in this question the 12 and the 3.6 for model a and to model b they're in the ratio 2 to 3 okay so i'm gonna do um a to b and this is a length ratio remember so length ratio um, it's 2 to 3, so let's work out what the 12 would be. So this is 12 for A. So I'm going to basically do, uh, well, I can either do two, 2 times 6 is 12, so 3 times 6 is 18. Or I could have done times 1 and a half. I suppose it's easier to do times by 6. So that's going to be the number for, for model B. That's the cone height for B. What would the 3.6 equal? Uh, well, now maybe it is easier to do on the calculator, just 3.6 times 
3 and then divide by 2, I get 5.4, which would be the radius for B. And now, with these numbers, I can get an answer using the formulas that, um, that the exam gives me. So, uh, I'll do the hemisphere, which is half a sphere. So, let's have a look at the volume of a sphere formula. It's 4 thirds times pi times the radius cubed. Now, the radius for B is 5.4. And to that, I'm going to have to halve that because it's a hemisphere. Now to this, I will be adding the cone, which is a third times pi times r squared, which will be 5.4 squared, times the height, which will be 18. So I've got to use the B numbers. This is the way I'm showing you as one option, is where I do it with model B. For my other option, I'm gonna do the same calculations, but for model A, and then use a volume ratio to get the same answer. And what we should, what I'm hoping is I don't make a mistake, obviously, and I get the exact same answer. All right, for which method, whichever method I use. Okay, so um, let's get this answer. Um, so let's type that into the calculator really carefully. So four thirds times pi times five point four cubed then halve that. So this is 329.7918. I'll round it to about that because it's going to be mo more than accurate enough. And then plus, uh, let's change that to a third. Let's change that to a squared. And then let's change this to a times 18. And then that's that, isn't it? So we get 549.653. And when I add these up, so add 329.7918, I get 879.44. So to three significant figures, I get 879, okay? So we should get the answer of 879. All right, that's the answer that we should get. Now, let me show you, and if you're happy with that, you don't wanna see what the other option is, um, although the other option is interesting and will be will involve some maths that will definitely be relevant to other similar questions. Um, obviously, just skip ahead, but otherwise, I'm now gonna do this question again, but slightly differently, okay? So this time, I'm gonna do model A instead. I'm gonna get an answer for this model, okay? So I'm gonna do exact same as I did before, hemisphere, but this time when I do the hemisphere, I'll be using 3.6. So I'm gonna have 4 thirds times pi times 3.6 cubed, and then divide that by two. Um, what does that equal? So I mean, obviously there's a lot of typing into the calculator, which is a little bit annoying, but it's a calculator paper, I suppose, so it's not that bit big of a deal. And then, uh, what do we get? So 97.716. The cone is a third times pi times 3.6 squared times 12. Because I'm, I'm being consistent here, I either use all the A numbers, which I actually got given, or, like I did here, I work out what the B numbers would be and then make sure I use them and I'm consistent. What a few people kind of did, and it was a little, you know, it me meant they lost quite a lot of marks, unfortunately, was like they, they used, for example, they used 5.4, but then accidentally used 12. Or they used 3.6, but used 18. And you can't do that. You have to do it completely consistently. So you've got to change both of these lengths if that's what you're going to do. So anyway, what do you get for the cone um, for A? So I'll have a third of pi times 3.6 squared times 12. And that's 162.86. Uh, zero two. Let's go. Let's be that accurate. And anyway, when I add these up, so add up 
I'll get the volume of A is equal to, so let's just add that to 97.716. <clears throat> and I get 260.576, so 260.576. And this is almost this is so close to my final answer. Now, here's where you could now go wrong. You could look at this height, um, this length ratio that we've been given, and assume that this now just needs to be um, sort of times by 1.5. But actually, that's not true because this is a volume. Okay, so if I've got a length ratio um, of 2 to 3, to get a volume ratio... Well, do you remember what you have to do to a length ratio to get a volume ratio? You have to cube it. So the volume ratio will be 8 to 27. And what that means is that we, we essentially have the following situation. We've got 8 to 27 is our volume of A to the volume of B. And we know the true volume of A is 260 0.576. So the question is, what's the missing number here? And so what I'm going to do is do 260.576, divide that by 8. That tells me my multiplier. So I've actually times that by 32.572. So when I do 27 times 32.572, well, let's see, what do we get? I get 879.444, uh, which to three significant figures is the exact same answer that I got. Now, the reason it's not quite the same on the calculator as um, if I scroll back up, see how we don't have quite the same answer? This is just because of rounding, basically. Just because of my choices of rounding, which is why, because I rounded like to three, sometimes four decimal places, um, it didn't matter too much in the end. If I rounded um, not as accurately as that um, and lost ac lost too much accuracy, um, I, I would end up with the wrong answer, okay? But um, as long as I am careful with my rounding, I'm gonna end up with the exact same answer for both, okay? Which is obviously a good thing. Right, question 17. Um, a, B, C, D is a quadrilateral. And we want, ultimately we want this angle here. So let's give that a name, theta. Um, so we have, basically we have two triangles. So that's the first thing to notice. Um, where we have some lengths and some angles. So this should be screaming trigonometry to you. Um, there's no evidence here of any right angles, so it's not basic Sokotoa, and it's certainly not Pythagoras. It means we're going to have to use cosine rule or sine rule, or is it asking or giving us any information about the area? No, so it's not the sine um, half AB sine C um, area formula. So it's some combination of the cosine rule and the sine rule. Now, if we're going to ultimately get towards this theta, um, if we knew what this angle here was, we could add these up and take it away from 180, but it would seem on the face of it that finding this angle is just as hard as finding this angle, perhaps. So it's not going to be about finding this angle. What I notice when I look is that in this triangle ABD, uh, the 5 is opposite the theta. And if I knew what this length here is, this BD, which seems like a fairly um, important length in this picture, and certainly one that perhaps it will be possible to work out, if I knew what this length was, I could use the sine rule to figure out what theta is. So let's give this length a name. I'm going to call it A. Okay, the reason I'm going to call it A is first of all, it's gearing me up for using the cosine rule. And secondly, it is actually opposite the angle labeled A. But before I can 
the, the way I need to figure out A is actually firstly to use this bottom triangle here um, where I've got a side, an angle and a side. So the angle is in between the two sides and I'm looking for the side opposite it. This is when you would use the cosine rule. Notice it's actually not possible to use the sine rule because the 10 is not opposite a known angle and neither is the eight. This means it must be the cosine rule. And I'm going to have the unknown, which is a. So a squared equals b squared plus c squared. So let's just write this out, I guess. Remember, you get given the cosine rule. Now, in this particular question, um, these values are 10 squared plus 8 squared minus 2 times 10 times 8 times cos of the angle opposite the A, which is 75. Okay, don't be put off by the fact that this 75 is actually labeled C. We're just actually focusing on this triangle here. Um, and if you've practiced enough with the cosine rule, um, it shouldn't really bother you what these things are labeled. Um, you just know it's this squared is this squared plus this squared minus two lots of that times that times cos of the angle between. You would practice the cosine rule 10, 20, 50 times, however many times it takes, and you will be able to do that. Okay, now this is obviously something you need to type into the calculator. So I'm going to do 10 squared plus 8 squared, take away 2 times 10 times 8 times cos of 75. Uh, so a squared is equal to 122.5889528. I'm not going to be rounding. Uh, in fact, I could just straight away, straight away write down what a is because uh, this is going to be the square root, isn't it? So a is 11.072, okay? Because like looking at how this number is here, I either want to go 11.072 or 11.07199. Either of these is probably like is probably likely to be accurate enough. So I'm just going to use 11.072. And now I can use the sine rule on this top triangle, which would tell me that sine of theta over 5 is sine of 135 over this length that I just found. Okay, because here are my um, sine sausages. All right. So apologies if you've never called them that before, but that's what I call them with uh, with my class, okay? So anyway, um, sine of that over that will equal sine of that over that. So there's my 11.072 goes in there. Uh, a simple timesing up by five tells me that sine theta is equal to five times this. Um, and therefore theta is equal to, and this is the a final answer that we actually want, isn't it? So sine inverse of five times sine of 135 over 11.072. So 18.62, blah, 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 which to one decimal place is 18.6. So just a little reminder there, Theta would be sine inverse of whatever this is. So let me just actually write that down so you can see what that is. It's like 0 0.3193, for example. Um, to get theta out of the sine, you have to apply sine inverse. Now, it's just worth me mentioning, um, it has to be the acute angle. It couldn't be 180 minus this because the angle of 135 would mean that that would be too big. So it has to be the acute angle answer of 18.6. Okay, uh, question 18. Um, here, here's how this sort of question works. I'm just trying to think of like the easiest way to, to explain this because it's on, on the one hand, it's kind of complicated, but also it's not that bad when you know what it means. So it's a bit of a funny one. Um, Let's have a look. We have Vn plus 1 is just 0 0.8 times the previous one called Vn. So the next one 
is 0 0.8 times the last one. So I know that V 2018 is 375 and I want to know what V 2021 is. Okay, this, this is the question basically. So V 2019 V 2019, which is one more than 2018, will be 0 0.8 times V 2018, which will be 0 0.8 times 375. And evidence of you doing this was worth a mark in the in, in, in the mark scheme. Okay, so 0 0.8 times 375 is 300. Uh, v 2020. <clears throat> is going to be 0 0.8 times V 2019, which is 0 0.8 times 300. So 0 0.8 times 3, you're basically just keeping timesing by 0 0.8. That's all you're doing. So you just keep timesing by 0 0.8. So this is 240. And so what do you need to do for V 2021? Well, it's 0 0.8 times V of 20, V 2020 which is 0 0.8 times the answer that we got, which was 240. And then what do you reckon? Will this be less than 200? Yes. Which is less than 200, okay? Which, which is what we wanted to show. Okay, so that's actually all you need to do for that one. Right, number 19. Uh, let's, uh, let's keep going. How many more do we have? Not too many, right, number 19. We need the gradient at five minutes. So let's look at that, there's where five minutes is, it's here. And what I would be inclined to do is just see if where you put this gradient, is there anywhere sort of nice that it can go through? And actually, nine ti 99 times out of 100, I would say, they're gonna give you a particular graph at a particular point where there's going to be where you do your gradient nice points it goes through and actually if you if you're careful that tangent line did I say the, where the gradient goes through I meant the tangent line goes through <clears throat> um, it goes through 2 0 and it goes through 8 20 and it that's definitely a tangent line at that point. Like, yes, it is a little bit subjective, okay? Like, if you did it slightly off, one way or another, it's still going to it's still going to be with in terms of a picture. You can't do it perfectly accurately. It's just a picture, so you just got to make sure you draw something that looks like a reasonable tangent line. And this looks like a reasonable tangent line at this point. And because I kind of thought to myself, well. It's an exam. They've probably designed it so that there's going to be easy coordinates that it that will work nicely. I was also kind of looking for them, and I managed to find some. Okay, so the gradient is the how far up divided by the how far along. That's fundamentally what it is. The along is always measured left to right, so it's always going that way. Sorry, that way. And if it's actually going downhill, then it's like a negative up and you get a negative gradient, okay? But here, this tangent line is going uphill. How far up has it gone? 20. How far along has it gone? Well, it's gone from two along to eight. That's six. And if you do 20 divided by six, you get 3.333, blah, blah, blah. So 3.333, dot, dot, dot. So I'm just going to write 3.33, uh, two decimal places. It's just an estimate. And, uh, you know, your tangent line might be slightly different to this tangent line. As long as you get an answer close to 3.3. can't remember exactly what the mark scheme said. Let's just see. Question is this, 19. It was anything between three and 3.6. So 3.3 is completely reasonable answer. <coughs> okay, and what does this answer represent? Well, the up was 20 kilometers and the along was six minutes. So what we've had to do is 
kilometers over minutes, kilometers per minute, that's speed. Okay, now you can write speed or certainly if it was going, if it ever went downhill because speed can't be negative, velocity it would is speed but with a direction essentially. Um, you, you would, I believe you would be allowed to write velocity here and certainly I gave the mark to anyone who wrote velocity. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, if I'm doing distance over time, I'm just gonna write speed, okay? Um, right, and then we continue this question. Work out an estimate for the area under the graph between T is two and T is eight using three strips of equal width. So I'm gonna have to do one, two, uh, three, four lines to make three strips of equal width. And then what's the idea is you pretend all of these are trapeziums. Sometimes they might be a triangle, right? If, if, if you actually started here, for example, if you started at zero, the first one would be a triangle. So you need to know how to get the area of a trapezium. You need to know how to get the area of a triangle. Now the area of a trapezium is you add up the parallel sides times by the distance between, which for each of these will be two, and then half, okay? So let's have a look. This height here is four, this height here is six, this height here, and the scale isn't that nice, um, it must be going up in 0.4s actually. So 6.4, 6.8, 7.2, 7.6, and 8. So the scale is actually little uh, 0.4s on the speed axis here. And so what that means is, um, so it's a little, not the easiest thing in the world. There's no doubt about that. Um, even whereabouts is 6. This one's 6, isn't it? So 6, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, yeah. So there's where six is. So 6.4, 6 6.8, 7.2 is how tall that one is. And then thankfully the last one is of height eight, okay? So the only tricky one really was making sure we, we worked out that that had height 7.2. Anyway, this area here is four add six. I halve that and times by the distance between. This area here is six add 7.2 halved and then times by the distance between. And then this last one is 7.2 add eight, halve that and times by the distance between. You type all of that into a calculator and you'll get your answer. It, this is a little bit random to, specifically to this question, but since we're halving and then doubling, those just cancel out. Now that's just specific to this question that that that's happened. Um, if the distance between was seven or something, I wouldn't just be able to cancel that. But it, but if they're both two, then I can cancel that, right? So if I do literally just four, add six, add six, add 7.2, add 7.2, add eight, um, this will give me the same answer as if I just typed that into my calculator. Now, if you don't like this and you think, well, I'd rather just actually use the formula, type it in into my calculator, fine but you will get the same as this, and this will just be a little bit faster. So four add six, add 7.2, add another 7.2, add eight is 38.4. Okay, and that's your final answer. Essentially, we're just working out areas and adding them up. They were trapeziums, so I need to know how to get the area of a trapezium. Right, question 20. Uh, we're told the area and we want to know this angle here, right? A, B, C is this angle here, okay? It is an isosceles triangle and we can confirm that obviously because um, they're both 11. Now, when we're told an area and we've got some lengths and we're being asked about angles, this is trigonometry again, okay? And it's gonna be the only one that's to do with the area. 
which is a half a b sine c okay or a half b c sine a or a half a c sine b the trick is the three letters just have to be different they all have to just be three different letters half a b sine c half a c sine b half b c sine a now the one i'm going to use is the one where the angle is a so i'm going to do a half b c sine a not that it matters particularly but this is actually the angle I'm going to be looking for to start with because it's in between the two sides that I know, which are B and C, right? Opposite the B and the C. So a half times 11 times 11 times sine of A, this actually is the area. That's the area formula. So we know this has to equal 42.5. So if I... Um, well, I, I guess I could work out what half of 121 is. I mean, I don't really even need a calculator for that, but there we go, 60.5. So sine A is 42.5 over 60.5, which means A is sine inverse of whatever this is. So that's my calculator's job. So sine inverse of 42.5 divided by 60.5, close my brackets. This means this angle here is 44.6. And since it's gonna to be to one decimal place, um, I might as well not round it too much, but, but maybe round it a little bit. Now that's this angle here. Now we should just note that actually it is possible for that angle up there, because it doesn't say anything about the, um, about the picture not being accurate, uh, or the, the picture could not be drawn to scale, perhaps. It does obviously look like that angle is going to be the acute one, but it doesn't actually say that anywhere, and it doesn't tell you that it has to, that the um, that it's drawn accurately, okay? So it is actually possible, this is just an aside, by the way, just before we finish the question. It's actually possible that this angle here, for this triangle here, could be, 180 minus 44.626. You see, if I do um, a half times 11 times 11 times sine of that 135 number, I get the same. I get the same area, right? And that's because sine of 44.6 is the same as sine of 135.4. Right, you get the same answer. Okay, now in the mark scheme, it may, uh, clearly doesn't acknowledge the 135 answer. It just assumes everyone will just use the acute answer. Um, but it's just worth it's just worth me pointing out that it could have been the um, obtuse one as well. Okay, so in any case, if we assume that it's the acute one, which seems like a fairly reasonable thing to assume given the picture then th this angle here will be 180 minus this and then halved because we've got to halve it across these two equal angles, right? Because it's an isosceles triangle, so both of these angles are the same. So 180, uh, take away 44.626. That's what these two angles here add up to. And interestingly, that's actually related to the other possible answer. You can have a think about why that might be. Now let's halve that and get the answer of 67.7, okay? Now I do just wanna check the mark scheme on that one, um, just cause that one I'm a little bit less sure of and I don't wanna make a mistake, yeah, so 67.7. So there you go, 67.7. Right, 21 and 22. Um, 22 will be faster to do than 21, but uh, we are going in order. Okay, so 21. Um, so this is how you do this sort of question. You are not allowed to use any circle theorems and your proof must be completely general. So you can't assume the sizes of any angles in your in your proof. You can't assume, oh, well, if this is 30, then this would be 60, blah, blah. You can't do that. You have to do it completely generally, okay? So one mark was for actually doing a little sketch 
putting a diameter in and um, putting some points on the circumference. So A, O, B is a diameter. C is the other point on the circumference. And we have to prove that no matter where we put C, that this angle here that I'm about to draw in is a right angle. Now, obviously because my circle is just so amazing, this does look like a 90 degree angle, but we have to prove that it is, okay? We actually have to prove that maybe if C was somewhere else, maybe it wouldn't be 90, okay? We're not allowed to use any circle theorems at all in our proof, so, how do we do it? Well, when you are first introduced to circle theorems, it's likely that you are just shown what the circle theorems are. But if you are go any, any sort of... Depends on how long you had to spend on them, really. Because what you can do is build them up from really basic facts. And one of the most basic facts of all is that this length and this length are the same. And if I join up, and this is the key idea, and as soon as you draw this picture that also puts this line in, you already have a mark, okay? So you already have a mark. You put in this extra line that joins O to C, and you put in some acknowledgement that we've got that, that, and that must all be the same length. Why must they all be the same length? They're all a radius of the same circle. So they're all the same length. Now let's fill in some angles, okay? We have an isosceles triangle here, and this is really where all the circle theorems come from, to be honest with you, is utilizing isosceles triangles. I mean, yes, there's ones that involve a tangent, which we have to um, kind of incorporate some other stuff, but really the ones that don't involve a tangent tend to have been born out of isosceles triangles. Okay, so all the radiuses are the same. We get isosceles triangles. So let's call this one X. And notice I've not sp specified what it is. I've not said 45. I've not said 30. I've, I'm calling it X because it could be anything, right? Where else is X in this picture? It's here, okay? And over here, there's no guarantee that this is also X. It might be for a specific position of C, but if C is allowed to be anywhere, then I'm, I should really allow this to be anything else. So let's give it a different name. It's what, let's call it Y, okay? You might use A, A, B, B. Here I'm gonna use X, X, Y, Y. And then one option you have is to add up um, the um, angles in a triangle. So if you do X plus X plus Y plus Y, because th these are the angles here, look inside this triangle. So if you do X plus X plus Y plus Y, you get 180 because it's a triangle. So I'm adding up the angles in triangle ABC. And I would write down angles in a triangle add up to 180. Right, you always put these reasons in. So angles in the triangle add up to 180. So anyway, can we actually claim anything from this? Well, actually, yes, we can. This is 2x plus 2y. And I can factorize this. There's a common factor of 2. And now I can divide both sides by two. And X plus Y equals 90. And this was, this was based purely on me drawing a diameter, a point on the circumference, and filling in an extra radius. XX, because it's isosceles. 
Why, why? Because it's isosceles. I suppose I, I, I technically, I technically should say, uh, you know, things like triangle um, AOC is isosceles. So um, angle OAC, OAC is equal to angle um, OCA, and I'm going to call that X, and angle, uh, sorry, triangle um, BOC is also isosceles. So angle OBC is equal to angle OC. OCB and I'm calling that Y okay so you put all your reasons in and here's the idea well the angle at the di at the circumference here this is the angle ACB isn't it so that's that's it proved then isn't it because I've proven that it has to be 90 no matter what literally no matter what and um, there is an alternative um, I do just want to show you what the what the alternative is. Uh, this one I think is 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 a little bit easier, um, but I'm still going to show you this 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 very very similar alternative. Okay, so I'm not going to redraw the picture. I just basically want to um, actually no, I will be I will redraw the picture. One second. So there, there. Right, this is, is a terrible picture in comparison to the first one, but never mind. So X, X, Y, Y. And now here's the other thing you can do. I would definitely encourage you to um, do this approach if you're asked a similar question in the future. Um, but you can also fill in these two missing angles. So this would be 180 minus 2X because the angles inside that triangle add up to 180. And inside this triangle, they have to add up to 180 as well. So 180 minus 2y there. And now this is a straight line. So watch what happens. I'll have 180 minus 2x plus 180 minus 2y. And when I add them up, I'm supposed to get 180 because it's a straight line. And so then I put a reason, which I can't really be bothered to write, I, I won't lie. But you'd write angles on a straight line equal 180. When you do some simplifying, I'm going to have 360 minus 2x minus 2y is 180. I'm going to add 2x and add 2y to both sides and take away 180. So 180 is 2x plus 2y. And now I do exactly what I did before. Which means 90 is again x plus y, which is this angle here. So yes, the key message with this though is isosceles triangles okay drawing your radiuses you've got isosceles triangles then you've got your other facts like angles on a straight line angles in a triangle uh, and then generally speaking that's how the, these proofs go there is every chance you'll be asked a similar question in the real exam okay uh, it might not be specifically um diameter of um like the one with the diameter, it could be a different one, but the method will be basically the same. Put in radiuses, use isosceles triangles. Okay, last one. I really, really hope that the sound has recorded and that this has worked, because otherwise this was a really long time, all right? Question 22. Let's start with this one because we, we're going to need to do both separately. Okay, so the idea is, is whenever I get two or more inequalities, um, I'll do each of them separately and then glue together the, um, the, the answers. Okay, so it's like uh, from one of them, I get a certain range for X. For another one, I get a different range for X. And what I'd be wanting to do would be to consider the overlap. When is it true for both of them? So that's what I'm going to do here. So let's look at X squared is less than 25 first. Now, I just want to comment on this because numerous people straight off, straight away said, Oh well, x is less than twenty-five. Uh, x is less than five. So let me just write this down. X is less than five? Question mark! Exclamation mark! Because this is actually not correct. 
okay? Let, let's consider a number that is less than five. It does work for some of them, I, I will admit that. Okay, so um, if x is 3, for example, I mean 3 is less than 5, and 3 squared is less than 25, because 9 is less than 25. But you're, you're not considering the fact that x being less than 5 allows for an in, like infinitely many values, including things like negative 10. Like, what's negative 10 times negative 10? It's 100. And that's b bigger than 25. So this is not correct. And I'm afraid it gets you no marks if you write that down. I mean, you, you might get some marks separately for, for work to do with this one. But if this is how you've answered this, you've lost, you've lost, I, I think most of the time you actually lose three out of the five marks. If that's what you've done. Okay. So you need to remember how you solve quadratic inequalities. You do what you had to do with this one as well, which actually, strangely enough, a lot of people did, despite not doing it for this one. You need to make it be zero. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pretend it's x squared equals 25. So I'm gonna do x squared minus 25 equals zero. And then I factorize this. So this is a difference of two squares. So x plus five, x minus five. And um, this is x equals minus 5 or x equals 5, okay? Now, you can also solve this straight away just by doing x squared is 25. So x is plus or minus 5, not just 5, but also potentially negative 5, right? Because either, either one would square to make 25. So you need these two key values, right? Minus 5 and 5, or could be summarized as just writing plus or minus five. Now, how do I then s sort of solve the actual inequality that I had in the first place? Because it's not actually an equals, is it? I was pretending. So how do I actually solve this? Well, I do a little sketch, okay? And I put in my um, x-intercepts, which is where it equaled zero, which is at plus and minus five, the values we just worked out. So here's minus five and here's five. It's a, a, a happy parabola, uh, so it looks like this. And then I'm asking, when is this less than 25? Well, it's less than 25 here. This is when it goes below the, um, or rather, sorry, let, let's just rearrange that slightly. So you see, I've, I've made it a little bit confusing by leaving it like that. This is, I'm asking about x squared take away 25 being less than zero, aren't I? Okay, sorry about that. So I'm asking, when does this go below zero? And it's where I'm shading in, okay? So this is solved whenever x is between minus five and five. Okay. So yes, x can be less than 5, but it had better still be greater than negative 5. Okay. So that's my solution for the first one. So the way you do it is you make it be 0. You then find the roots, which is where it crosses the x-axis, which is done by solving that equation. Okay. Um, you want this to equal 0. Right. And when it equals 0... You've got to factorize it, you've got to use the quadratic formula, whatever it is you're going to do, you get your answers. Okay? Right, now, separately, we also separately have um, 4x brackets x take away 1 greater than 3. So, uh, let's see um, what this one does. So, I'm going to start by, I'm probably going to start by expanding the brackets. So, 4x squared take away 4x. Then I'll take away 3 is greater than 0. And what I would want to do is find out what the roots are of this quadratic. Um, now I can do that by attempting to factorize, or I can use the quadratic formula. Um, I guess I, I will show you both. Okay, so I'm going to first attempt to factorize. So what I want is um, to work out what AC is, which is minus 12, and what B is, which is minus 4. 
I want two numbers that times to make minus 12 and add up to make minus 4. Uh, these numbers are minus 6 and 2. This tells me to split the minus 4x up as minus 6x plus 2x. So 4x squared and just, um, it, I mean I know it doesn't really matter. So I'm going to, I'll write it the order that I've done it. So minus 4x squared minus 6x plus 2x minus 3 greater than 0. I factorise this and I factorise this. So this is 2x brackets 2x minus 3 and then this one is well the bracket has to actually be 2x minus 3 if you look so the number on the outside would have to be 1 which does actually make sense because it's one lot of 2x minus 3 and then when you combine these that's how it factorizes now, the solutions, the roots that you would get from this if you pretended that this was equal to zero would be um, minus a half or three over two, okay? Now, sorry if I've rushed that. It's just I'm literally just going to make that it be zero. So take away one and then divide by two or this one, add three and then divide by two. Um, so I guess I'll show you the, the, the version where we come where we do the quadratic formula. So where would these come from? Um, so we're just gonna pretend I'm solving um, 4x squared minus 4x minus three equals zero um, with the quadratic formula. So a would be four, b would be minus four, c would be minus three. Um, so x will equal minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a which is 4 plus or minus 16 take away 4 lots of 4 lots of minus 3 all over 2 lots of 4 and with my calculator this square root is um, 8 so it's 4 plus or minus 8 all over 8 divide top and bottom by 4 1 plus or minus 2 all over 2 so it's either 1 plus 2 which is 3 over 2 or it's 1 minus 2 which is minus 1 over 2 which is minus a half so you get the exact same answers um, sorry again I've rushed that slightly but it's it's just quadratic formula if you're not confident with that practice substituting into the quadratic formula anyway let's keep going um here's my little sketch uh, here's minus a half here's three over two this is minus 0.5 this is 1.5 and again it's a happy happy parabola when is it greater than zero here and here so this is solved by x being less than minus a half or x being greater than three over two. So let me just maybe double underline that one. And now these are my two sort of separate solutions. What is the last thing to do is ask when are, the, when are both of these true at the same time? So if you have a look at the extremes, x for this one, x can go down to minus five, but then for this one, x can go up to minus a half. Okay, so the, my first one is minus five up to minus a half, or x can be bigger than one and a half, but it is limited to five, right? It's got to be less than five. So x has got to be between 1.5 and five. So that's the other one. And it's this overall solution here. Um, which is the final answer. 
Okay. So anyway, hopefully that's been useful. Um, please do get in touch uh, either by coming and seeing us, talk, you know, to come and talk to me, or you can send me in uh, an email on my school emails, uh, and I can go through anything in a bit more detail. Uh, put stuff up in starters, things like that. Just let us know. Anyway, yeah, thanks, thanks for listening. I uh, hope it's been useful. See you later.